This is the Dane Moore MBA podcast brought to you by Prize Picks coming at you late Monday evening. It's February 12th, and we have the Wolves' blowout win against the Clippers to get to in tonight's show with Kyle Tige. I'm out here in Portland for these next two games against the Blazers. So we're recording this one at the Tige household. How are we doing, Kyle? Doing well, sir. Doing well. How's it going? Good. I like we didn't just sit here and watch the, the whole I know, game right next to each well, other. Well, we should get out in front of this right now. Probably no video for this one. Yes. Because you and I are just legitimately wearing sweatpants sitting on my couch. But uh yeah, I took like I took like I was telling you before the game started, I took like ninety six hours away from the team. I was on a vacation. And then to come back and watch this. I like this. Right. They should do more of this. <laughs> this was a good time, so Yeah, it was that was, I mean, one of the I guess I haven't really wrapped my head around it like if it's the best game or one of the best games of the season. I mean, I think there's things you can look at with like the box score that make you be like, okay, maybe this wasn't the most dominant game the Wolves have had all season, but watching it, it kind of felt like it was. Maybe that's part of that was the opponent. Um, Maybe part of that was kind of like the runs that the Clippers were going on. Really in the first half, it was kind of like a blow for blow sort of game. And the Wolves did that thing that they do in third quarters sometimes where they just uh, are able to completely put a team away uh, in the third quarter. I think they won the, the third quarter in this one, 40 uh, to 19. You kind of knew Ant was going to come out aggressive uh, to start that third quarter, as he often does in those situations. But it, it wasn't really just an Ant game or a Cat game or anything. It was kind of everyone just sp- – well, we can get into all the guys and what they each did individually that stood out, but – It just looked like a collectively really strong game from one of, if not the strongest teams uh, in the Western Conference against, obviously, another uh, really good good team in the West, too. uh, That Yeah, I I thought the third quarter is where this really made you be like, okay, yeah, this this Wolves team can kind of not just play with anyone, but beat anyone. Yeah, flat out it was the best win of the season, right? Like, and I know that might sound hyperbolic in the moment, but... Like when you're 12 years old and you say that was my best birthday, well, if you have a better birthday as you get older, like as you progress through the season, I know they had a really impressive Celtics win and they had a nice Nuggets win, uh, but just to come out in a game that, you know, the standings, whatever, first place, second place in the West, that stuff is, I know there's some tiebreaker things that are important, but that Clippers team is really good. And they were, I mean, I, I like listen to Ryan Rossillo. He just straight up picked them to win the West like last week. Like they have been ever since the Harden trade, they had about a week where James had to get in shape, and then all of a sudden they just went on a tear, like twenty and four or something with Harden. They hadn't lost two games in a row, I think, since the Harden trade or since that week that they gave Harden to kind of get in shape. So to come out and just go toe for toe, like you and I were sitting here writing down notes. Every time the Clippers, they never had like a knockout punch, clearly, but every time they even threw like a jab, the Wolves immediately responded. There was never, you know, they they never really, not even let go of the rope. They never even let them kind of stand on their two feet. Uh, I was trying to see what the biggest lead was for the Clippers. Four in the game. Yeah. Uh, biggest lead for the Wolves. That on was, the night. was at halftime. Yeah, and that right. was, uh, I mean, just start there maybe because the game was so good, 40-19 to 19 in the third, 72-47 to 47 in the second half. But execution from the players was awesome. The coaching staff was awesome. But there was that little blip, right? You're trying to think of this now as, is this like a, Second round playoff series is just a, you know, God forbid, Western Conference playoff preview or whatever. Uh, There was that little snippet in the second quarter where they got away from Mike and they put Nikhil in. And because James Harden was kind of bullying Mike, you know, in the post and just he's just so much bigger than Mike Conley. And all of a sudden the Wolves had no floor general and it all went to hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I think I think Monty Morris hit his first shot and made it like 43, 33. And then the Clippers went on a 26 run after that to to end the first half. So there was a little blip there where the Wolves, you can't have the four starters plus Nikhil because you just don't have someone out there to kind of, you know, drunk drive, put put everyone in their positions, get everyone home safely. Don't have somebody to drunk drive. Yeah, no, wait. Yeah, you don't have anyone to (laughs) drive sober for the drunk drivers. Uh, But it just, that was like the only, I guess, red flag was they didn't really close the first quarter well. They were up again, like 28 to 20, and then they kind of played with their food. Same in the second quarter, and then they just came out what eight zero run to start the third, yeah. and they really never looked back after that. The the thing I I put down in the the first quarter was cat is the matchup 
Like this is he was this awesome. Is, this is the matchup that you know the Wolves have that the Clippers can't match up against. They didn't have a an obvious answer there, and they got to be the second quarter. I was like, Harden is the matchup. Same thing for them, where the Wolves didn't seem to have an answer there. And like you alluded to in at the end of that second quarter, it was that twenty to six run, kind of flipping back and forth from do we want to have Conley out here or do you want to have Nikhil on him to to guard him and. Harden makes that big three at the very end of the the second quarter, and you're like, "Uh oh, is that now the predominant advantage in in this game?" Because Carl didn't really do much in in the second quarter, but then it was Ant in the third quarter who had a very quiet first half. It's I just had the box score up the whole time, and I'm like, "How are the Wolves winning by so much when Ant was like over six from three, over eight from three, over nine from three? And he finishes one for 11 from three, yet the Wolves win by 21 against the Clippers team that was clearly taking that game seriously. It, it absolutely had the, you know, trappings of, of two teams fighting for, for the number one seed in the West. But you look at the rest of Ant's box score. So, yeah, it's one for 11 from three, but he goes seven for seven from two, a bunch of crazy finishes, attacking the basket there. Plus, he has seven rebounds eight assists, has a steal, only only one turnover there, and ended up leading the Wolves in plus minus. So that he could shoot one for 11 from the field, or from three in a game, and the Wolves still win that while Ant still feels like one of the most impactful players, I thought that's where it, it kind of turned there, where we're like trading advantages in the first half to being like, actually the Wolves just kind of have more that they can get to um, than, than the Clippers could in this one. And I thought that's what really kind of broke it open was being able to play that ant card uh, in, in the third quarter and and then everyone kind of follow suit off of that. Yeah, the cool thing about this, and you and I were kind of hyped all day about this game because it was two, we talked about like styles make fights. Like it was two very contrasting styles, right? Like this is, the Wolves might be the biggest team in the league, at least the biggest team in the West, right? Obviously the Boston can throw up big lineups and Orlando can too, but the Clippers are really wing oriented and guards and so so switchable, and it didn't really matter. And that's why I went back to that Nikhil moment in the second quarter where Finch, for a second there, he saw Mike kind of getting bullied by James a little bit. Where he's like, you know what, we're gonna kind of pivot to respond to what the Clippers are doing. Um, and I don't know. I I think back to this whole experiment and this whole roster building and Finch and Tim Conley kind of puffing out their chests and being like, hey we're going to make you respond to us type thing. Like we're not going to downshift our size to try to translate to what the other team's doing. So outside of that, I feel like they just leaned into in the second half they were playing. I mean, Kyle was the backup point guard, right? I mean, I know Monty Morris got in there. Nikhil didn't play in the third, probably ironing out those rotations. It was obviously Monty Morris's debut, but uh, they just leaned into being big and it didn't hurt them at all. And it, no, it didn't hurt. I mean, the Clippers tried to go small. They tried to play Zubots. They tried to play Plumley. They played Tice. They had no answer. It didn't really matter. Yeah, it's, I mean, we kind of, I don't know, once we got 25, 30 games into the season, you start and you see that the Wolves have, what were they, 22 and 6 or whatever they were at, at kind of the, the peak of the time. And you go, okay, what is this team susceptible to? Who are the teams in the West that might give them problems? And they hadn't played the, they hadn't played the Clippers yet. And you were like, oh, I think I think that might be one of the teams that would be a problematic matchup for the Wolves. And now they've played them twice, beat them at Target Center, and crushed them tonight in, in L.A. And it's just not proving to be an advantageous matchup for the Clippers in the ways we thought. And I think it is to your point because the Wolves – even against this opponent, have not had to change their identity, their rotation, their style of play uh, to match the the Clippers. They have enough guys to be able to guard on the perimeter. Like, yeah, okay, we can nitpick with the Mike Conley on to James Harden sort of thing, but if that's really your primary defensive issue against the Clippers, like, okay, that like you, you'll be able to, to figure that out. And that they – were still able to be themselves that Rudy was still able to be you know dominant in the rim and that they were at the rim and they were able to be the defensive team that they've been this whole season I don't know I I, I don't think we could 
say that the Clippers are the most dangerous opponent for, for the Wolves in the West. That's just two pretty convincing victories. And I don't know, like that first game against the Clippers was kind of tough when the Clippers went small and that's how they kind of made their run uh, in the, in the, for, the fourth quarter of that game. If I'm remembering correctly, they didn't really go smaller. I, I just, I don't know what the, I guess the Clippers answer is for the Wolves to give them an advantage or to be viewed as, as the favorite in, in this matchup other than just needing, you know, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard and James Harden to be elite, elite shot makers. And that's just difficult to do when you have, when you do have the wing depth of defenders that, that the Wolves have. I'm it, It's, I don't know. I would like predict the Wolves to, to sweep the Clippers or anything, but you caught me six, eight weeks ago. I would have probably been like, yeah, I think the Clippers would win that series against the Wolves. And it's it's getting harder. It's getting harder to make that argument. I think the Wolves have outscored the Clippers in seven of their eight quarters in their last two games, which you know, small sample size, whatever. But they've also beaten the Clippers straight up in six of their last seven games, which again, Harden's only a part of. It's a different Clippers team, but if you're a Clippers fan, you can just walk away with this saying, I mean, like I literally saw James Harden was at the Super Bowl, so you can just say a little Super Bowl hangover, or whatever. One game we didn't, we came out flat. We'll. In a series, See, I don't think they came out flat though. No, I know, I, I, but I'm saying from a Clippers fan, yeah. like, you know what I mean. Like if you're trying to cope, as oh, sure. I've been good at doing in life, like you're just like, <laughs> hey, didn't go well, all that stuff. But if you're a Wolves fan, I mean, it's a symbolic win in the sense that, like, Terrence Mann was non-existent tonight. He did start, uh, but this is the team, the Clippers, that possibly forever like ruined or adjusted or altered Rudy Gobert's perception. In oh, the yeah. league, this team, in the way that they would want to play, right? With five out and making Rudy defend and chase and stuff. And the reason, and we've talked about this all the time, but it's worth bringing up tonight of all nights. The reason it didn't work in those Utah years is because he had to play defense for basically all five guys. And you watch tonight, and I don't know if this is just the most perfect selfish segue, but I thought Carl was probably the best player on the court tonight. Uh, he was awesome. We should talk about just him in 2024, essentially playing all NBA basketball. But Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, all these other guys, Jay McDaniels was like the best defensive player on the court tonight. He was incredible. And by having him and by having Ant, by having and Carlos playing good defense and Mike and Nikhil and all these guys, it just allows Rudy to not have to do what he did in Utah when he did get, you know, I don't want to say exposed, but in that situation he did. So, uh, yeah, you know, Ty Lue, we were saying this before the game, right? Like, Ty Lue might be the best coach in the league, or he's one of the three or four best coaches. I'm sure him and his staff in a seven-game series would find clever ways to pivot and try to throw some stuff at the Wolves. But if you're a Clippers fan, you got to look at these last couple of games and be like, there's an issue there, and I don't know how we solve it. Because in those two games, the Wolves have just gone toe-to-toe, and then they've just knocked them out early, and they've never really looked back. Yeah, I just, I guess I don't know what, like, what are those tricky things that Ty Lue could go to? I mean, it just seems like it would be going small and not playing Zubats, Tice, or Plumley at all. It would probably it, be, like, taking 53s. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, something wild, just like, we're just going to cast. And I, I was thinking, too, watching that, like, a, one adjustment I would make is, like, I I would love if this these two teams play in a series that, like, make James Harden just score. Because right, I still don't think he has any burst. He has no real way to get to the rim anymore. It's a lot of perimeter stuff. But I think I saw that since the Clippers acquired him, they're 16-2 and two when James Harden has 10 or more assists. So like you can't let him be a facilitator. They didn't tonight. He finished with six assists, right. 17 points. Uh, George and Kawhi both had 18, but he was you know basically one of their top scorers. And that just does nothing for them. At, the, at this age in his game, you you want to make him have to attack and be an uh, offensive minded player. So, uh, yeah, yeah I don't know. Their big three are combined eighteen for forty six from the field. Eighteen for forty six, and if you add in bones, they were eighteen for forty six. Still, <laughs> oh wait, he didn't play. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean just just across the board. Also, you just kind of box score hopping around. Obviously, I said Jaden was great. Rudy was seventeen and ten, four blocks, two turnovers. No one, uh, Ant, Mike, Carl, Jaden, the guys that you're always pretty used to having a lot of turnovers, right? Just had yep. one apiece. Um, and then obviously... Which is becoming a, a trend for the better for this team right now where that has been... The turnovers have been down for... I, I think we we look at that Bulls game and you're like, oh, no, fourth quarter disaster. 
they must still be having the same issues. But this is a handful of games in a row where they very much had their the turnover issues like in check for sure. And I know you got to get to a break, but one other thing that's like, again, box score hunting, a lot of guys played. It's a blowout. But it was nice to have a nine-man rotation where you really could trust the ninth man. Yeah. And – I know Monty Morris. Yeah, only... so I I want to do I want to okay. do the 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 Monty thing, and we'll 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 grab the break here, and then kind of focus on his his Wolves debut. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Falling Knife Brewing Company and Brit, and myself will be at Falling Knife on February twenty second. I guess that's in in ten days. Uh, it's the it's the last day of All Star Break. It's that Thursday. Um, we are going to do a live show. Um, the live show is going to start at seven. Uh, we're kind of going to do the happy hour thing we normally do before people come at six o'clock, say hi, uh, get a drink, get a spot, and um, yeah, we will. Britt and I will will do a live show there. We always take um, listener questions when we're doing those as well. And it's just you know, it's been a while since we've done one of these, so it'll be fun to kind of get everybody uh, to together. And right before we we jump into the I don't call it the second half of the season, the post All Star break uh, part of the season. Uh, so again, that's that's this coming uh, February twenty second. Come at six p.m. Live show will start at seven, and then also just want to let you know that uh, this week it is this whole West Coast uh, stretch. Obviously, tonight's game started at nine thirty uh, Central, but the next two against the Blazers, I think, both start at at nine p.m. And Falling Knife is staying open late those nights. So if you're looking for a place to go watch. Uh, either the Blazers games, uh, Wolves Blazers games, Falling Knife um, will be open late, uh, even though it's a it's a 9 p.m. tip. And then today's show is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Uh, Kyle, what have you been what have you been like? What did you what did you do on Prize Picks tonight? Well, first of all, I just want to congratulate myself because I had a hell of a Super Bowl run. Uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, who was my pick? I gave you the. Oh, yeah, Kyle Uzcheck. Oh, Kyle Uzcheck. Like I mean, Kyle Uzcheck. If you're out there listening, I owe you some money. Um, but no, prize picks. So like football season's done, right? So mm-hmm. now it's like kind of pivoting, and you're like, well, what would I do? Prize picks. Their NBA slate just expands. They have the whole demons and goblins thing we've talked about. But so like tonight, I think Rudy was over under 13 and a half rebounds. But you could do like a a goblin and get it at 10 or nine and a half. So, and they also have all these like new weekly challenges and ways to get like credits and Taco Tuesday. So like if you're watching Wolves Blazers on Tuesday. There's like little discounts and all that stuff. Plus, like PGA is coming in, and there's like season long for baseball. You can do like Byron Buxton home runs at over under twenty four and a half. So, despite football yeah, like being we over did with the NBA ones, yeah, I know, I know football's done, and you might think Prize Picks is kind of going to be an app that falls into the back of your phone, but they're they constantly come up with new things. It's a really cool app, and again, I always stress that it's like you said, daily fantasy, not like a sports book or whatever. But also, too, it's really easy to get your money in, money out. So. uh I, if you haven't tried it before, it's a fun way to just, you know, have a glass of wine, watch the r- Wolves route the Blazers, route the Clippers, and uh, just bet on. Tonight, my big one was Ant over under .5 dunks. And once Ant had that dunk late in the game, I celebrated and everyone won. <laughs> uh, that is prizepicks.com or the Prize Picks app. If you use the promo code DANE when you sign up, they will give you a $100 sign-up bonus. Uh, all right, Kyle, let's uh, let's do some Monte Morris talk here it was it was his debut i'm gonna look up just how much he played in this game is about 18 and a half minutes uh he was one for four from three took one i think kind of in garbage time there but he did make that first three i think the thing that i'm always looking for with a new player um is one where are they where do they fit into the rotation and how do they meld with that group of players that they're they're playing with with morris you just kind of knew he was going to be one of those guys that wasn't going to stick out like a, a sore thumb. He just, he looked very comfortable integrating with the group, I thought. And and then he took the Jordan McLaughlin role and a little bit more. Uh, Ant always plays the whole first quarter and third quarter, right? And then that's normally when Jordan McLaughlin checks in from is at uh, the, you know, the start of the second quarter, the start of the fourth quarter. Well, uh, Morris came in at the start of the the second quarter, and he kind of played those six minutes that J Mac normally plays. Uh, but then I thought it was interesting in the the second half they brought him in right away with the first sub, just kind of like six minutes into the quarter, right when you're starting to have Nas Reed and Kyle Anderson and stuff fit in there. So it's, I mean, I guess it's still like the ninth man role on this team, but it's a little bit bigger piece. 
uh, of of the pie than than J Max role has has typically been there. Obviously, in this one, they they blow him out and they're able to save some minutes all around. And a lot of the bench guys played a lot of minutes. I mean, Mike Conley only plays twenty four minutes. Like you said, Cat didn't even play uh, in the fourth quarter. He only plays twenty seven. Jaden only plays twenty five. So I don't know if you know nineteen minutes a night is the expectation uh, for Monte Morris, but I think you're going to see two full stints uh, a half and and probably somewhere around that 15 minutes uh, a night mark even though he is kind of the functionally the ninth man on this team right now one game small sample size blowout win I was shocked at how much he played <laughs> but not like in a bad way but just I mean again he's only played now seven games this season but 18 minutes is a season high for him. Like, I don't think he ever touched that when he was in Detroit. And again, yeah, it was all like 8 to 16 minutes when I looked at the game. Yeah, line. and again, that you can almost take nothing from anything that the Pistons do in the last three years. But just to throw him into the fire. And, you know, Chris Finch is a tough guy at times to not earn his trust. But, you know, I could have seen Finch wait in a week to acclimate him into the whole system and stuff. And he just literally threw him out there. A big game, yeah. And I... And you're right, by the way. I'm not nitpicking that, but like the Jordan McLaughlin role. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know the last time Jordan McLaughlin played 18 minutes. Like he just sure. threw him out there and said, "I trust you." And for Finch and all the things I like about him, I think that's one of the, maybe the flaws is that he's has a shorter leash for some of these guys. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's not going to pop off with you know off the off the box score with five points, two rebounds, two assists. But he had a timely steal. He did have a really athletic block on that yeah. one. It just insanely pornographic defensive sequence where he gets a block and then Rudy gets a block and there's just a scrum for the ball. Uh, But if nothing else, I think what's cool about maybe a backup point guard, he took that big three, obviously on that kind of pick and roll with Rudy is just, it would be ideal if there's games where like, I don't really remember Monty Morris playing, but that's a good thing. Like that's kind of what you want from your backup point guard is to just keep everyone else again in their lanes, doing what they're supposed to do. He's not here to, he, they, they did not acquire a bucket getter. Like yeah. that's not in those three categories we had. That is not what Monty Morris was. They acquired a backup point guard, and I thought tonight, as much as Jordan McLaughlin is a fan favorite and does a lot of cool things, there were just little intricacies that Monty Morris had tonight. There was just like, yep, that's an to elevated get, to get a guy version. like that too for essentially no cost. You know, like that's just another kind of feather in the cap of this front office for being like they identified a slight weakness. And they were able to fill that role. And all the contract stuff you talked with Britt last week on the pod was really good. And I highly recommend, if you want to know about the bird rights and the importance of all that stuff, go back and listen to that pod that Dane did with Britt. But, uh, yeah, I mean, first first debut, he's got a little dog in him. He's tough. Uh, and he, also, he was not scared to take shots in, in certain moments. And that's what this team needs. I mean, that was across the board tonight, too. Like, right. shot of the game was Kyle Anderson in the corner just <laughs> letting it rip in the same corner that – viral pregame videos were showing him throw a knuckleball so just this whole offense was really clicking and I have some offense stuff I want to ask you about but overall for his first game I think you have to be like hey whatever you graded the Wolves backup point guard C plus or whatever you move it up a level now you're like I think that's a I think they have a B plus backup point guard that can do a lot of things and fill Mike if he has to miss a game or you just want to try to manage Mike's right. minutes down the stretch he was open a lot in that, oh, in that yeah, first yeah. Okay. And, and <laughs> Watching these games with Dane, like he's got a real old school notebook. He's like a 65-year-old man. He's writing all these notes. And what's the first thing you said when Monty Morris was out there for like 60 seconds? And you're like, his teammates need to learn that he can actually shoot. Yeah. Because they're not used to whoever that fifth guy is in those rotations, those backup point guards, being a threat with the ball to shoot. And they were a well, little hesitant just used to, to like ball. ignoring that and being like, "Oh, actually, a kick out here to, you know, Kyle Anderson or Shake Milton or Jordan McLaughlin is not an advantageous thing." And you saw like Montez in the corner, <laughs> like waving, like I'm open. These are shots uh, that I make. So I, I guess I say that to mean like they're gonna figure that out and they're going to. I mean, the the bigger thing is the second unit should be able to shed some of if not all of that like anvil of the the lack of shooting that yeah. that they've had at times and you know now you can play Kyle Anderson and Rudy Gobert at the same time so long as the other three players out there are shooting options there was always this blockade in the rotation that Finch sometimes ignored and and cost them at times but 
just having another guy that it's not it's honestly not even about whether or not like what the percentage is that the players were shooting because like McLaughlin at like 38 percent or something on the year from three that that wasn't the issue that J Mac wasn't hitting them at a decent enough clip the issue was that he was not getting guarded Mm -hmm. and and with Monte Morris they're not like the scout is not going to be to play off of Monte Morris you know it's not to say that he's not going to get open threes from time to time but I know that's just something I think to even just in these three games here before the before we hit the the all-star break it's just to track how much does it feel like that sort of toxic lack of spacing is still there if it was you know before the trade deadline was seven eight nine minutes a game can we cut that in half can we get rid of that completely for some games I think now they have with Monte Morris I think they have the personnel to be able to sort of shed that which is a big part of the reason why this team is still 17th or whatever uh, on defense so I I think yeah I, I think he's just going to be a good solid fit for for this Wolves second unit and be able to provide what that role was missing before which was being able to maintain the ball without turning it over control the ball and be a three-point threat that in and of itself is going to I don't want is transform too much too big of a word for the second unit maybe but those are real issues with this this team this season, and and I think Morris does a lot to kind of help that go away. Only Ant and Carl took more threes tonight than Monty Morris. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but it also too, I I think it's a credit to him. He had some. I know you're following along and covering the whole like his introductory press conference, but I liked the comedy. I, sure like, I was driving. <laughs> okay, you're following it from afar. Yeah, yeah. I I liked his comment about like staying back or all star break and just grinding film and stuff because if there's one thing, if you miss tonight's game or you know. It was, it's late one on the West Coast. If you weren't a Wolves fan and you tuned in that game, you would not have known that this was his debut. Yeah. Like he just kind of mm-hmm. seamlessly fit what they were trying to do. And again, only one for four from three, whatever. But just his ability to not be scared to let it rip when this free flowing offense and the trust the pass and all that stuff. Like if the ball finds you, there's probably a reason. Like let it rip. And he let it rip tonight. So I just thought really impressive. And if that's what you're going to get as a baseline, Mm -hmm. it's going to be really exciting to see what he looks like you know come middle of march when he's a little more when he's more comfortable with his teammates and his teammates are more comfortable with him i I want to uh focus a little bit more specifically on like cat and rudy and what some of these guys did individually in this game but i just feel like this is a good time to plug in a little bit of buyout guy talk um just now that we've seen what this rotation looks like with this team right now um the role that is left to be filled by a buyout guy is the shake Milton, Troy Brown jr. Role, which is the 10 11 thing. Like you, if it is Marcus Morris or if it is Evan Fournier or whoever it is that they, they go out and get, it is not a role that I think comes with guaranteed minutes. Like if they get, I mean, Marcus Morris, obviously Pat Bev pod or whatever, uh, (laughs) reported that is confirmed. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I'm not disputing that at all and wouldn't be surprised at all to see Marcus Morris be on the uh, on the Wolves whatever after the you know after the All-Star break but I think what is important for us to know or remember is that they're not like if they get Marcus Morris it's not going to replace the Kyle Anderson role. I think it gives you a pivot off of it maybe at times when you can't survive the the or Carl, Kyle isn't able to be taking threes, whatever you're feeling it from a spacing standpoint. But whoever they bring in, like this, this, this is going to be the nine. That these are going to be the four guys off the bench: Nikhil, Nas, Kyle, and Monte Morris. And then the tenth guy, it's gonna. I feel like it. It's going to be a randomly plugged in here and there. Maybe a guy misses a game, and then that per then Morris or Fournier or whoever gets plugged in there. But do, do you get what I'm kind of getting at there? That And I feel like the Shake Milton, Troy Brown Jr., for everyone who's been watching this team all year, like knows that those guys were out of the rotation, but sometimes they were kind of in it. And I think that's what the that's what the role of any buyout guy X that comes in is. Yeah, no, that's good timing. I mean, if I can put my fan hat on, it's fun to have transactions and acquisitions, right? And the trade deadline 
last week as a whole was kind of a dud. And there's a lot of reasons to go into that. The Wolves obviously make one move and they get Monty Morris. And then, yeah, today the whole Marcus Morris stuff. I think as a fan, you can be excited about the possibility of Marcus yeah. Morris signing with this team down the road. Again, probably worth noting that uh, he's still a spur <laughs> and he would have to get bought out. And I think it's like a 48 hour waiver period. And then I, I do think the deadline is like March 1st. So I don't yeah, to be expect mm-hmm. to see him in Portland this week or whatever. But uh, I think you can be excited about the opportunity to sign a guy that brings a little, you know, sure. toughness. Uh, he would be Jaden insurance, in my opinion. Like that would be the role he'd have. Be excited about, wow, guys I know and have watched play basketball want to sign with my favorite team. That's exciting. I would also be frightened if he ever plays. <laughs> because, again, like to your point, I mean, I, I come back to like nine-man rotations and ten-man rotations. I hate the idea of a ten-man rotation because I never want Ant or Carl not on the floor. Like I want one of those guys, two offensive just juggernauts, like always on the floor and then building rotations around that or whatever. So I don't think he's ever going to play. If he signs here, you do have to wonder, like, is there some sort of sales pitch on, like, we are going to carve out a role for you or something? That's, you know, who knows? But I, I I look at the Marcus Morris thing similar to the Monty Morris thing where it's like, he blew me away tonight playing 18 minutes. I didn't see that coming. But I think Morris is just more of a insurance policy where, like, if things don't go right, you know, you, you have a Jade McDaniels punch another wall. Now you need Marcus Morris to play. But at full strength, like you said, that's your well, nine. And, and it. And also, you're right, to the somebody gets hurt, whatever, if you need to put another person into the rotation, like, I, I think we've come to grips with the idea that you're not getting any impact this season from Josh Minot, Leonard Miller, Wendell yeah, Moore that, Jr., Don yeah. Lyon. So, to that end, you kind of do need depth um, for a player that you could plug in if somebody rolls an ankle or or whatever. Like, maybe they're not in the rotation right away, but you're cool with them situationally needing to be able to do that and and with Morris I mean I didn't get a chance to watch any of him today but you know just looking at the stats last five seasons from three 40 36 37 47 and and 41 uh, I, I think we've all seen him play a lot over the years huge mid-range volume guy like that's kind of his his offensive game obviously you'd, you'd like him to be more of a, a spot up three guy for this team, but the physicality uh, that, that he could add would be, you know, advantageous for, for this team too. So we'll see uh, if that, if that happens with Marcus Morris, I just wanted to talk about even before with the quote unquote news of that Morris thing came out. I just wanted to talk about like what that role could, and, could even. And look I, like. I do think, and this is weird because I do sense myself talking out of both sides of my mouth, but I do think there is real value in having like a toughness coordinator. Sure. Like I also well James Johnson. Right on the on the same side like there's nothing I hate more than a guy that talks a bunch of shit that never leaves the bench cuz it's like like that's pretty easy to just be like you don't play <laughs> like don't talk to me. Yeah, right. But I just I I just think again like this is about having insurance. It's really fun to have new players on your team and see what jersey numbers they're going to have, but you know like this starting five is one of the three or four best starting fives in the league. Like you want those five guys out there like a, mm-hmm. I don't know thought I saw the other day, like a plus 11 net rating on the seat. Like, you want those five guys to play a bunch of minutes come playoff time. And then, you know, factor in a little bit of Nas as your third big and factor in Nikhil on the wing. Just Mar- Marcus Morris shouldn't play ideally. But if you need him to, all the stuff you just said about his ability to space the floor, give a little toughness. Also, like a beloved teammate, which, again, I think we are entering this phase of vibes and all that stuff matter. Like, how locked in are these teams? And... I mean, the Minnesota Timberwolves have one of what seems to be the most cohesive units, locker rooms, whatever you want to call it in the league. So if they can go get him, that'd be great. I don't expect anything to happen this week. That's probably more of a when everyone's bored next week on an off week during All-Star break. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just cool to see again as a fan. I'm not used to buyout season, the Minnesota Timberwolves ever being in (laughs) tweets. So and whether they be Woj tweets or Pat Bev tweets, it's a it's a new venture for us. So. I've got, I've got some offense stuff I want to ask you about, but what else do you want to go into? Let's uh, let's grab another break, and then uh, we'll come back with Kyle, get into the offense. I want to talk a little bit more about Cat and Rudy as well. All right, Kyle, we can um, we we can get into. I'm not sure what you have over there <laughs> in terms of uh, what that means with with the offense. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't. Well, we were just kind of hitting on everything quickly at the beginning of the episode. I don't want to brush over. 
uh, what what Carl did in the first quarter. I think that really established uh, the advantage the Wolves had in in this game. They don't have a a strong matchup for Cat in a one on one situation, um, and when Cat is able to get that drive game going and force them to double him, even if they if that's not their initial plan, that's a real win for for the Wolves' offense. I thought he really triggered that uh, early in the game, even if he didn't score a ton after the first quarter. Establishing that early with Carl getting Carl kind of in a good rhythm. Um, I find that always to be big. I think particularly recently that a strong start is big for him. I thought it was big in this game. And then, I mean, I don't know what to say about this Rudy stuff defensively other than what we're saying every day, but it is, it's insane. I mean, the, the dominance, the dominance at the rim, particularly against like three real at the basket weapons in, in Harden, Leonard and um, and George that that Rudy can be that impactful while also kind of taking away Zubats, who's a really good drop off option. You know, typically when you watch the Clippers, when the big comes over to you know stop a hardened drive, that's very often leads to a Zubats dunk. And I remember it's like the end of the third quarter or something like I'm like I said to you I was like. I think that's the first thing Zubats has done th- this entire game. So that Rudy, I mean, that he's able to control his man and really negate the other team's weapon, primary weapons. I, I, we we say it all the time, but it just it really deserves every game recognition because it is just as special as you know somebody going for 35, 40 points when he's playing. Like this defensively, it is the equivalent of that on on the offensive side of the ball. Plus, like in the way offensively, more and more that he's imposing himself. I had another one of those like straight line drives from the perimeter, like in the first quarter where they just like weren't guarding him and he just like sprint dribbles. Is that when he caught it at the top? Yeah. yeah you love that shit. <laughs> Dave well, went crazy. I, I, I love anything that isn't just Rudy's in the way or Rudy's stuck, you mm-hmm. know? When and that that was kind of like the whole push shot thing that I got obsessed with. It's just like these little things that Rudy can do that makes him not just survivable offensively, but a weapon at times. There's been more and more of that over the course of the season. Yeah, it's still not clean, and he still like shoots a shot or two in the paint at the rim with two hands every so often and misses them. But I think the I think we're seeing a lot more offensive game from Rudy Gobert this season than we've probably ever seen from him in his career back to the Utah days because there's a greater freedom and and he's doing more with that and being able to punish guys with some of those duck ins and has a little bit of more control to his his post up game and is able he had that big dunk over Kawhi that was off of an effective like post move creating space and creating himself an advantage at the rim the the defense stuff um deserves recognition because it's just special as good as it gets in the league but the offensive stuff to me is getting better and better night to night and when we do start thinking about the playoffs the real story of why the clippers wiped off the jazz and where rudy was at fault there was that he was not able to be an offensive weapon at all for the jazz in that series and he could not punish Terrence Mann on on the other side of the floor on offense when they were guarding him with a six foot five player. Rudy Gobert right now has a lot more ability to be offensively impactful against a small ball lineup or just in general, I think, than he was uh, in in Utah a, a couple of years ago. And that's that's doing that's doing a lot for this team. I'm curious because you're in the locker room, right, for all these home games, and now you're on the road, and you're just the busiest, hardest working beat writer, beat reporter. I I think one of the cool things about Rudy too, because it kind of popped out tonight a little bit with, again, they're playing the Clippers, and there's the Westbrook stuff, right? When Westbrook was clowning him for his free throws when they played in Minnesota a couple weeks ago, uh, and Rudy did have that push shot, I think, early in the first quarter might have airballed it or barely grazed rim, and the Clippers bench went crazy again, right? By the way, in a game where James Harden airballed the three and Kawhi Leonard airballed the three and Russell Westbrook just completely bricked a dunk. But 
we always do like leadership power rankings over at Flagrant House, and it's always like Mike Conley one, Kyle two, or Kyle one, Mike two. I I oh, just yeah. Rudy's really, up there. I really enjoy Rudy. Like you had so many stories about him coming over to Utah, right, with him and Donovan Mitchell and the COVID thing, and just you didn't know what to expect. He really is one of the most professional players. Like he, for all the stuff we don't love about straight voltage and Ant and the hay and all that stuff, Rudy. I mean, how many times did I look at you and I make, dude, Rudy got hit in the face again, <laughs> right? Like on some attack. Like I some, just look at him. He's letting them. <laughs> some Zubac hit. Like, but I just think he really carries himself and he has to get, and maybe he does already, but he has to get some credit for this culture change, this shift. It's not just all Mike Conley has fixed everything. Like Rudy Gobert is playing. You saw it tonight even like on a national level, people saying somehow he's found another level at even in his 30s to be like a more dominant defensive player. I mean, there's a real case to be made. He is a shoe in to win his fourth defensive player of the year award. Let's like, he's like minus 700 right now, but he might be playing his best defense of his career. And that's, you know, seven foot three guy in his thirties. Like, I don't know what the track record is historically for that type of stuff, but his, his presence on defense was, I mean, I like to coin that term. Never minds. Like there were so many never minds where, there was even a moment where Paul George like cut from the right side, got into the paint, gave it to Kawhi. Kawhi was right there, two feet under the basket, and then like jumped out to like a seven footer, like a fadeaway seven footer, which he made because he's Kawhi. But like those little things, it's just no one wants to mess around with Rudy in the paint, and that type of dominance and presence is valuable in and of itself. And then to see what he's unlocked on offense. Uh, has been pretty. I mean, he backed down Kawhi on that little dunk, and yep. that's like a tone setter. Like that, sure. that stuff's real. The bench loves that shit. So, another impressive performance by him. He's been playing out of his mind, and he won't make the All Star team unless he's obviously like a late filler for an injured guy. But uh, he's having an All Star season. I remember um, when we were in Denver for the the playoff series, and I was sitting around on media row with, with Jace. And we were talking about like Deandre Jordan was out on the floor warming up or something. And, and, and you remember it last season with, with Gobert and Jace was like, well, maybe just some of this is Rudy Gobert being 30 uh, yeah. and being seven, two. And it's not uncommon that great seven footers are not impactful and anywhere near what they were once they hit their 30s. And, De and, and it, was, it was a good example. DeAndre Jordan, it really, you know, he went from being one of the most impactful fives in the league to, you know, you kind of turn the page onto his 30s, and it was like, all right, he's a third center. And, and, and I remember thinking about that at that time, and I'm like, yeah, this really might not be – this just might physically be – what the direction Rudy's going. I think that's the thing I try to remind myself of this season is, is Rudy's not just, you know, playing smart, adding some things offensively and defensively. He looks to not be at a lesser physical stage than he would have been four or five years ago. I mean, again, I wasn't watching every single one of those Utah Rudy games back then, but the it, it just struck me like on one play where Rudy like crumbled like fell over in this game. <laughs> I don't know why it stood out to me, but he just his like ability to like pop up and sprint back on defense. That I think we forget that that's really rare and hard to do at seven two and two hundred and fifty pounds or whatever to be as I don't know just be a great athlete in 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 his thirties. I think that. uh that's part of the reason why I didn't think this was going to be going as well as it has gone this year, because I didn't, I did not think we were going to get this version of Rudy Gobert's physicality. And now you're going to make some sort of joke about him being hurt last season. <laughs> I was going to say, well, that's a crazy way for you to, to admit that, that he was, was uh, probably not at full strength last year. Uh, <laughs> no, what was it? You just, he has to trust his teammates more. No, I mean, it, it's just, Maybe it's, both of those things are it, happening. It, it really is almost like a different player, right? I mean, I know we're just kind of gushing over him now, but with the... I mean, I, 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 think, I think he won this game, man. Like, it wasn't... Yes, great, like... Great start from Carl. Jaden played good defense. Great, yeah. And, like, had a good start to the third quarter. Why did they win this game? Because Rudy was consistently 
dominant. But it's why it's funny that you and I keep bringing this up is because I will go to my grave like that. He whatever his health was last year, he is one hundred and twenty five percent healthy. Like mm-hmm. that's. I would say now the bullet is a fact, well, and, and, but, and and he's and he's said as much. Yeah, right. he said as much. So I I'm I'm relenting. But but on the same point, there were aspects of him and the way he would show up his teammates or call for the ball. He also didn't have trust, right? Like yeah. this is the rare first take debate where we're both right. Like he didn't trust his teammates, and he was probably banged up, which probably led to insecurities and you know anxiety and all that stuff. He he trusts his teammates now. He knows that he is surrounded. Even Carl, again, like he is surrounded by either average, which is fine, or really plus plus defenders, and that makes his job easier. I mean, again, tonight he was able to roam off of Russell Westbrook, which is another. I mean, going back to that Clippers thing, like if they're going to play Russell Westbrook, despite all of his energy, and he was in full on fu attack mode right from the get go tonight, uh, they can just let him stay way off of Westbrook and let him shoot and do all that stuff and. No concern whatsoever, but yeah, he is he is playing just at a level that I mean, this is even tonight because you know obviously Dane's out here with me in Portland, so we didn't get the the pleasure of listening to Jim and Grady do tonight's game. We had the Clippers broadcast, which almost made Dane do drugs. Uh, but the whole time, you know, they made mentions multiple times on a national level broadcast about that how his name's Rudy Gay. <laughs> yeah, Rudy. Who was they it? They didn't say that. I like when they said Nas Reed just checked in. He had been in for like seven minutes, yep. but uh. They made two, like, you know, the Wolves play, paid a really steep price to acquire this player, but they were like, two, but it's really paying off. I mean, look at how absolutely dominant this guy is that no matter, I mean, the Clippers tried to throw three different centers at him. None of them even made a mark. They tried to go small. It didn't really matter. Yeah, it's a February game before Valentine's Day, but that was a notable, notable win on one of the few nationally, semi-nationally televised games that this team has as a statement win. I mean, that's what they did. They came out tonight. After a couple of days off, one of the longest breaks they've had all season, and they made a statement on this. I mean, to come from what they did against the Bucks, right, and have a couple of days, and now come do this, and then you have these true cakewalk games to kind of enter the All Star break. But if they bring sixty percent, fifty percent of the intensity to Portland these next two games, as they did tonight, they're going to sweep that series. So impressive stuff. Yeah, and. And I just hope they do. You know, it's gonna feel yeah, a lot last better. Year they for lost that. to the Blazers in both games, and it was miserable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just like they, they have a really, they have a really good chance to really end the first half of the season on a real high note and right make here. a statement, right? Like you send two All Stars to Indianapolis. Yeah, you send your head coach to Indianapolis. I mean, Alan Horton had it today. I think they've been in first place alone, seventy-one of like the last eighty-five days. That's not nothing right like and i I, i'm stealing this from our friend john krasinski but uh he had a great one the wolves are 11 and 5 in their last 16 games those five losses have come by a grand total of 17 points Hmm. that's 3.4 points per game their 11 wins have come by 168 points 15.3 like what what they're doing is they're playing awesome basketball we just in our brains, and I, that's fine. We we think of that choke job against the Magic. We think about that choke job against the Spurs. Right. But they're playing awesome basketball, damn near for the whole 2024. And I think a lot of it is because Carl Anthony Towns might be playing. Like I know yeah. we kind of already did, but I think it's it's tapered down a little bit. These last five games have been kind of a weird blowout, blowout choke. You know the Bulls thing or whatever. But I think Carl's playing maybe not statistically his most productive highest volume of his career but when you factor in winning i think conte towns is playing his best basketball of his career Mm -hmm. um the the last thing i had written down that i feel like is is worth touching on is that was a really physical game okay um and i thought the officials kind of let it be physical too and and i think that's how it will be in the playoffs more and I think it's it's noteworthy that they kept their heads and they did not get out physical or out frustrated by the referees in this game in that type of setting against that that type of opponent. That's another one of those kind of lurking fears you have about this team is, you know, what what is going to happen when another team matches their physicality and frustration creeps in because of it. 
and that certainly happened this year, but it, it, it didn't happen tonight, and it didn't happen in a game where you maybe almost would have expected it to. So I think that's a, I think that it's a, it's a credit to them to to have played a physical playoff style game and looked like they belonged in that type of game. I'll do you one better. If the wolf, if you took this Wolves team and you put them in the '90s, I guarantee you they win one title. <laughs> Because no, I'm like because I think if you get a Clippers game like that where it's really stop it's like start four tons, better tons of whistles like the Wolves want to play '90s level physicality like I'm not talking hand shaking but like they want to play physical that's part of their DNA like they're not just because you know guys like Carl and Rudy and some of these guys have like a persona they're physical like they're long they're big they're physical and tonight I mean I thought it was. It's weird that we're doing this, but for all the complaining I do, I thought tonight was like one of the most well officiated games that I've watched. Because, like you said, they just kind of let them play, and that's when the Wolves are really at their best because they get into a rhythm, they can get up in you. I mean, Ant yep. had a couple of those kind of I call them pit dog, pit bull possessions where he's just like he gets a bucket and then he's like cla- like clapping his thighs like he's really into you at the top of the key. So it, that's going to be something to monitor not only the rest of the season but in the playoffs is like. If they get an officiating crew, that is. I mean, you and I transitioned into Wolves Clippers after watching Rockets Knicks, right, where everything was a foul. So that's something to monitor, too, is, like, if the Wolves can just play how they want to play and not have to worry about – I mean, they're not grifters, right? Like, they don't seek out fouls like a lot of these other teams do or these star players do. If they can just play basketball – and people swallow the whistle and for the most part, the, that's big. And that should be the assumption in the playoffs, is that's how the yeah, playoffs yeah. are more typically officiated. And this is looking like a team that can play within those type of constraints of of the game. you know. And that, that to me, is, is noteworthy with this team. Um, I, I think it's their emotions and their ability to get overzealous in that and with the refs is is something that you know has bit them in the ass that this season and it didn't uh it didn't tonight and i, I think that that matters um can, yeah. in the in honor of the super bowl can yes. we do an overtime overtime topic quick yep i'm i'm Be- out so. because you did you said with Britt the other day that you thought the wolves had kind of turned a corner a little bit offensively just a little bit yeah so just for the, do you know what the Wolves are on the season in three pointers attempted, like ranked in the league? Uh, it's like twenty twenty fourth. Fourth. In the month of February, five games, right? That magic collapse, mm-hmm. Rockets blow out, Bulls collapse that they absolutely should have won, and then they blow out the Bucks, they blow out the Clippers. Do you know what they are in the last five games? They're ninth. Again, small sample size, right? But this uh, but, is kind but of. They, but there's clearly been an intention. I mean, it was Carl shot sixteen. Um, against Again. the Bulls, mm-hmm. and then he shot what was it? Then I think he shot eight against Milwaukee. Six against Milwaukee, five tonight. Okay. Um, so again, like, that's been a little off. But he he had a couple games in late January. It was like fifteen, right? Well, there was just the, there there have been the there was a lot in the beginning of the season where it would be like three, you know, right. yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and that that's just the that's inexcusable. And 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 you're talking about the the three point volume. As a as a whole, and Carl can't drive up the three point volume as a whole of the team. Um, but what he can never do is have a only three three point attempts game, you know. And and I think he's moving in that that direction there. Um, you know, I thought with you know Ant driving, Jaden was willingly taking them when when he was open there. There's just there's been a lot more of actually spacing and standing set ready to shoot. On, on the perimeter in these last five games after the magical film session or whatever, um, where this team looks like it wants to shoot more threes. And and they, they are, but I feel like just watching possession to possession, there there's there's less of the Jaden looking for a drive, Carl looking for a pump and go, um, you know, Ant not looking to get to the step back and instead getting the mid range. Like he's he is looking for 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 the three point option more. And yeah, I would assume post All Star break that if they get into it at 24th or 23rd or 22nd or something like that, I I bet you this will be an above average or around 15th in, in three-point volume. I think that would do a, a lot for this team. And that's what we're talking about, right? We're trying to add all – what are these like six, seven things that they can add offensively over the final 30 games of the season that you put that all together in the pile 
and you go, we're not a shitty offensive team anymore. And I, I, what those things are, are starting to come into clarity and they're starting to do them more often. And that's why, that's why I do assume that this team is going to turn uh, a corner offensively. And I think it's, yeah, it's starting to happen. And again, it's a small sample size, but the, it's a small sample size, but a very meaningful topic because all we did in January was rip the shit out of their offense, right? Like you can't, you're a fake contender if you're going to be the 20th ranked offense in the league or the 18th ranked offense. So again, I'm very acutely picking my stats here, but in that same five games for the month of February, they're sixth in offensive rating. Uh, on the season, it's kind of weird if you actually look at the Clippers and the Wolves. Yeah, the Wolves are 24th in three-pointers attempted, but they're second in three-point percentage. Point three behind who's in first? The Clippers. Mm. So it's just, again, like these little things we were talking about in January, I was really focused on Carl should never rest without taking seven threes or eight threes, right? It's not just Carl elevating that because tonight, again, he only had five. But I think, and you're kind of maybe seeing it, that's my point, is that there's probably been, whether it be that magical film session or a daily thing where maybe they finally realize okay the defense is so sustainable and we can it'll travel anywhere we can bring it to milwaukee we can bring it to la we can bring it to the west coast but now we like let's let it rip and you've been saying it in all these post game pods and all your interviews with rudy and locker room stuff that like rudy's saying it like yeah. we gotta let it rip from three like we the the seven foot three frenchman who plays defense is like i want my guys to take more threes like that's crazy so <laughs> It'll be something to monitor. I'm sure they're going to have, you know, 35 threes a game or something against this Portland team that's undermanned, and, and they're, it's going to be up and down and probably at least one blowout mixed in there too. But when they come back from the All-Star break and they're refreshed and they have everyone kind of acclimated more, I hope that's something that sees, you know, like they're mm -hmm. not going to get to top 10 in the league in three-pointers attempted, but can they get to like 14th or 15th and just be league average? Because they yes. have the guys they, to they make They can. Them. They absolutely can. And they should, and they should have already been doing that. That this, it's not good that it's at twenty fourth right now, but it's it is what it is right now. It's what is it going to be going forward? And I think there's real reason to believe they have turned a corner in some of their right. habits. Yeah, I guess is, and this this is developing the three point volume into one of your habits. That's you know that's that's meaningful for for this team who just needs to continue to to level up offensively. You got anything else? <laughs> no, just a sincere apology to anyone that doesn't like me because I think I'm going to be doing like five pods this week. So <laughs> buckle up because it's going to be a lot of me and a lot of Dane. But uh, I'm excited. It's kind of like. Yeah, no, tomorrow will be fun. It's also like a throw. I mean, you and I have been friends now for a while and we've been doing this for a while. And again, this we'll have this on YouTube, but it might just be Facebook photos of our faces or something. No video. But uh, this is kind of like an old school throwback for us this week of just late night gamer pods. Yeah. If you're in Minnesota or, you know, the central time zone. Or God forbid, the worst time zone, the Eastern Coast. Uh, it'll be in your feed hopefully every morning when you wake up, and it's gonna be a fun little way to ramp up for a break. I know the Wolves just kind of came off of a break, but yeah. they get a week off. There'll be a lot of cool stuff for fans and Ant and Carl and and Finchy in Indianapolis. But uh, yeah, I, you and I are gonna be doing a lot of content this week, and then we'll take a break, and then it's gonna be a sprint. Hopefully, knock on wood, until uh, mid middle of June. Yeah, Kyle and I will be back. Uh, well, we'll be both at the game covering it um, at Moda Center. On, on Tuesday night, we'll do another, I think, sort of late night pod uh, off, off of that game. So that'll be up first thing Wednesday morning. Um, Britt and I are going to record um, sometime on Wednesday afternoon. So that'll kind of, I guess, be the Wednesday evening, Thursday morning show there. And then Kyle and I will do another one off of the, the Blazers game on Thursday night. So, yeah. A lot of Dane and Kyle. Um, we'll, yeah, we'll just kind of lock in. And we'll now, they were in LA today. We're in, in Portland. Um, we'll be around the team for, for the next few days. And it's always fun to kind of, when a team is in, I like doing these trips when the, when the team is in the same spot for, for a while. Feels like, kind of like, I don't know. It, it just has a, it has a different vibe to it, a little bit more settled in. Um, they're going to be in Portland, you know, basically for, for the entirety of the week. And, and we'll be there, too. We'll be doing a lot of pods. Um, he's Kyle Tige. You're following him uh, on Twitter at Kyle Tige. He's also going to be doing Flagrant Howls tomorrow uh, oh, as well. So uh, check that out. And uh, we'll be back late on, on Tuesday night and talk to you then uh, Wednesday morning in your feed. Until then, he's Kyle. I'm Dane.
Peace out.